Wonderful. Okay, well, I'd like to really thank Neil for the uh, introduction and uh, Neil and everyone else involved with setting up Horizons for inviting me here and I'm happy to do it. So what I'm gonna describe are some recent findings. I'm gonna describe some of the historical work from a few years ago that, as a setup for some of the more recent findings. Um, from our group. First, I'd like to really start by acknowledging uh, uh, the key players involved uh, in this work. Uh, Roland Griffiths, um, primarily, um, who's been doing psychopharmacology research for 40 years or so, and a wide variety of other really excellent scientists and other colleagues. Um, Catherine McLean, who's uh, Help with some of the very recent work I'll show you. Uh, another postdoc who was with us, Chad Reisig, now at the FDA. Um, Bill Richards, who's been doing uh, uh, clinical guiding with uh, LSD and psilocybin, dating back to his work in the 60s. Mary Casamana, one of our other primary guides. Brian Richards, another guide. Um, and a variety of other um, individuals who have importantly, in one way or another, contributed to our work. Also, uh, funding from different aspects of our work uh, is coming from the National Institute on Drug Abuse, um, Council on Spiritual Practices, and the San Francisco Fund, Hefter Research Institute, Beckley Foundation, and the Betsy Gordon Foundation. So thanks to all of those folks who have made this work possible. So here's what I'm gonna go over with you today. Um, the initial, initial study in our laboratory examining the psychoactive effects of psilocybin at high doses in humans um, as a basis for then looking at some 14-month long-term um, or persisting effect follow-up data. How are these people looking over a year after their psilocybin experience? And also very recently, a couple months ago, we published uh, on the dose effects of psilocybin, so four active doses plus placebo which you think is really important for informing future clinical trials and other trials. Um, and also some data generated from that work um, uh, that we're uh, hoping to publish soon on psilocybin and headache. And uh, also some recent work you may have heard recently in the press about psilocybin um, causing uh, changes in the personality dimension of openness. Um, also briefly about some survey research we've done, looking at the, some of the measures we've used in the lab and probing um, folks that are out there using psilocybin mushrooms and seeing what kind of correspondence we might find and asking some other questions. And also briefly about some pilot work looking at psilocybin and smoking cessation treatment. And if I have enough time, which I hope um, briefly describe uh, uh, the first controlled human study showing psychoactive effects of salvinorin A, which is in a different pharmacological class um, of hallucinogens. It's a cap agonist, but nonetheless a hallucinogen for sure. So first, psilocybin. I'm sure you all know it's an it's, uh, active agent in over 100 species of mushrooms, mostly in the Psilocybe genus. Uh, history is ancient, used by indigenous cultures. Just some examples here. You might recognize in, the, um, in, in this section here some of the mushroom stones from uh, Mexico, Central, and South America. Um, dating back up to a thousand years. Um, and then uh, perhaps a little more controversial, um, but it seems compelling, these uh, cave paintings from Northern Africa dating back perhaps 10,000 years. And so if you believe these sort of the mushroom sprites and this mushroom sprouting uh, bee shaman, if you think that has anything to do with psychoactive psilocybin mushroom use, we're talking about it ancient history indeed. And intriguingly, um, that history seems to be surrounded by a focus on sacramental um, or mystical use, if you will. Uh, pharmacologically, we know that the primary side of action that plays the key role is the serotonin 2A receptor um, for, the, for psilocybin and any other uh, classic psychedelics. Um, they were right, widely researched in humans um, from the 1940s through the early 70s. However, because of increased street use of LSD, association with counterculture, marginalized research, and basically it was 30 years when not a whole lot was done, um, which is a really peculiar case when you're talking about a whole domain of science. Um, 
So the first study was, the goal was to broadly assess the effects of, of high dose of psilocybin and high functioning spiritually involved people with no history of hallucinogen use. This study was wrapping up right uh, when I uh, started my work as a fellow at Hopkins. Um, and uh, I'll show you some work in a little bit where we hope to follow up on those data. It included some measures atypical of other um, uh, human behavioral or psychopharmacology research. Um, so if you're studying cocaine or nicotine, alcohol, you normally don't ask about mystical or spiritual effects or necessarily about long-term, especially long-term positive persisting effects. But certainly given the history, those were the domains um, uh, that were interesting uh, to probe. Uh, nobody was paid, they were interested, and in they uh, they're curious about psilocybin. Um, we're talking about middle-aged people largely, largely college-educated, um, employed, um, respectable, well-functioning uh, people, basically. All had an interest in spirituality as a backdrop. Uh, I thought that was uh, uh, one important uh, step for assessing uh, some of the mystical type and spiritual questions. Of course, it's also very, a very intriguing question to see how that uh, propensity towards spirituality might affect some of the results. I haven't done that work yet, but it'd be great to look at that. And also, we, most importantly, in terms of screening, we screen out psychiatric vulner vulnerabilities. No, I, with first degree relatives with a known psychotic disorder, and we psychiatrically screened um, with structured interview to exclude folks that looked like they could have um, major psychiatric disorders. And uh, I won't say a whole lot about our pre preparation and safety procedures. Um, uh, I'll say a little bit, but I'll direct you to a paper that we published outlining um, uh, what we've used in our laboratory and also what we're recommending that others use or use something like this. We at least want to start the debate. Um, you know, in some of the older work, folks have um, ran out of the lab while they were on a high dose of a psychedelic and that, of course, could be really problematic um, as these, these new trials are coming up and something like that would be... Um, you know, uh, would be uh, something that could hinder, you know, make a, a, you know, someone at the FDA question, well, should we allow more research with this? So we really look at the safety. The most important part about the safety beyond the screening is the very careful preparation, the trust and rapport building with the people that they're going to be um, in the room with when they're on psilocybin. So the, we call these the guides or the monitors. So very strong pr trust and rapport building. In this study, about eight hours of that. Um, so each volunteer had two sessions in this first study, psilocybin, high dose of psilocybin, high dose of methylphenidate, you'll know is Ritalin, um, higher than the typical um, uh, Dose, uh, dose of Ritalin, something that's going to have clear psychoactive effects. Um, some received psilocybin first, others received methylphenidate first. Um, there were two sessions for two months apart, so we have an ability to see um, uh, some pers 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 persisting effects um, before we switched over, crossed over to the other drug condition. Uh, the room. Uh, the eight-hour drug sessions were conducted in a living room-like environment. The two monitors were always present. One was always present, even if one was out for a couple minutes to go to the bathroom. And the participants are simply asked to lie on the couch, wear eye masks and headphones through which classical music is played, focus their attention inward, look inside, trust, let go, and be open. If you have any trouble, let us know. We're here to support you. Hold your hand. Other than that, go inward. Here's the room. Uh, yeah, not your typical research lab, obviously trying to uh, make it uh, a beautiful, much like the MDMA room that Barrow presented in her talk this morning. So here's some of the most interesting data. Light, this is a validated measure of the so-called primary mystical experience that's been developed in the psychology of religion, thought to be a a human phenomenon across religions, across cultures, in which uh, someone can have an experience um, uh, characterized by uh, domains such as a unity, uh, experiencing a unity of all things, some type of transcendence of time and space, stepping out of time and space, um, some type of sense of ultimate uh, benevolence, um, in some sense that one's experience, what they just experienced was somehow more real than everyday reality, or provided some sort of glimpse into ultimate reality that's not there every day. So this, this measure assessment 
assesses one's lifetime experience, um, experiences um, and basically how much, uh, how far out their lifetime experience has been in terms of these domains. And you can see after the first session, those receiving methylphenidate scored here, which is actually above the norms of the population, but they scored here. Um, folks receiving psilocybin first shot up here, and they weren't different at baseline, which I'm not showing you here. And lo and behold, once the two groups crossed over, everyone's received both drugs, bam, lifetime significant um, um, a mysticism scale shoots up to the same level. And uh, some of the other more interesting data that generated from that study was um, and 30, about 35% of these folks said that this was the single most spiritually significant event of their lives. Um, you know, these were, like I said, largely middle-aged people. They were spiritual seekers, largely extremely well-functioning people. Um, so this is really telling, especially when you add the, the top five. If you include it among the top five, you add these two together, you're talking about about 70% of people. So the large majority of people um, came out of this saying uh, the psilocybin session uh, was one of the most um, spiritually significant events of their life. You can see that that distribution trails off as we go to categories such as, you know, it's very much spiritually significant, moderately, slightly, not at all. And you can see there's a distribution there for methylphenidate with even a couple people saying that session was among the top spiritually significant, significant events of their lives, but clearly the distributions don't overlap. We're talking about, there's a, so there's a, con, there's a role of set and setting here, obviously, but there's also a clear role for pharmacology. Psilocybin is doing something. And you see a similar pattern for changes in well-being. People are making uh, uh, claims. They say, I'm, I'm, I have a better attitude. I'm, I'm just doing better in life. I'm friendlier, various things. Um, but, you know, everyone likes to think good of themselves. What other people think? Um, so we actually um, asked each participant to designate multiple other adults. I knew friends, coworkers, family members. Structured telephone interviews were conducted. Um, remember, this is a double-blind study, so certainly the folks out there, their friends, weren't told what drug condition they were on. Um, and assessed them at the beginning of the study and once, two months after each session on 11 dimensions, um, including inner peace, patience, good naturedness, humor, playfulness, mental flexibility, et cetera. And lo and behold, I'm showing you our aggregate score. We get significantly higher increases, um, attributions of, um, of positive changes in attitude and behavior with psilocybin, but flat at zero with no change with methylphenidate. Suggesting that, um, yeah, these effects um, uh, may stick around for at least two months. So what about after two months? So here I'm showing you um, data from this follow-up study we published um, a couple years ago. Um, I showed you the data before on spiritual significance and how that change was different between the methylphenidate first and the other psilocybin group. Well, at 14 months with these black bars on these various dimensions, you see essentially a sustainment of all of the claimed benefits both in terms of personal meaningfulness, their attribution of how personally meaningful the session was, how spiritually significant, their increased uh, personal well-being, and also positive behavior change. And interestingly, looking at what's the need of that attribution over a year later, why was this so important? Why was this so valuable? Why do you think so highly of it? Um, here we're correlating um, ratings of spiritual significance at the 14-month follow-up and see a robust correlation between the score on the mysticism scale immediately after the session. So before they even went home, seven hours after they swallowed psilocybin, they filled out this experience about the nature of their experience. Those scoring higher on the mystical scale were robustly more likely to find the uh, um, experience uh, spiritually significant uh, over a year later. And if you just look at that same correlation with instead of the mystical nature of the experience, just how strong the drug effect was, this is drug intensity for the HRI scale, you get a big flat nothing. So this is not about just an effect of a very salient event or pounding someone over the head um, with a sledgehammer. Um, it's the nature of the experience, not just uh, heating the receptors with a particular drug. 
So these are some of the, the dose, uh, this is the study, the dose effect study I mentioned earlier. Um, the design by uh, nearly all accounts was very similar to the previous ones. So all the stuff I said about the selection, the type of volunteers, the way we conducted it is largely identical here. Here we had 18 participants, methods very similar, so, except for there were five sessions, they were separated by one month. Um, and the doses were a true placebo, not an active placebo in this case, and then 5, 10, 20, and 30 milligrams per 70 kilogram, we adjust by body weight, of psilocybin. Half received eight sending doses and half received descending. So we didn't completely randomize. We wanted to address multiple questions. Um, while we um, had half ascending, half descending, we randomized the placebo within that. But this also allowed us to not only answer questions, what are the differences between doses, but what are the differences in the sequence? Is it better to start it at the lower end of the pool and swim over to the deep end, or is it better to go off the high dive, just plunge right into it? Um, and we assessed persisting effects three weeks afterwards. Um, I'm going to speed up a little bit, but you get clearly orderly, observer rated, and physiological effects. Um, very beautiful. I mean, this is with four active doses and placebo. So you just see this nice, beautiful time and dose related, um, uh, orderly nature of the data. The ascending, descending. So we got some really interesting data here. Um, there were different. Here I'm showing um, increased well-being and/or life satisfaction um, ratings at the one-month follow-up. And this, um, and these are the different doses of psilocybin. Uh, you see some uh, hint of a, of, a, of a dose effect here, not very steep in the descending function, but you see a much clearer dose effect function um, uh, for the ascending um, folks. And you, to the degree that you actually see statistical significance at the 20 milligram dose where you get significantly more. You get a trend for a significantly more life satisfaction with the 20 um, in the ascending group. So this, we think this is really important going forward, especially with, um, especially with therapeutic applications um, that uh, uh, sort of runs contrary to the older um, recommendations from so-called psychedelic um, type of therapies, which you want to do is go in with the most overwhelming experience right off the bat, you know, uh, you know, squash this person's ego and just give enough of the drug to make sure that happens and that's what you need to do. Well, these data would suggest differently. They would suggest you have better luck um, exposing the person to a a lower dose of the drug and then building up over a couple of doses so they get a feel for things and aren't so, um, I think it reduces the, confu the sheer confusion that someone can have when they're thrown into an extremely high dose session. Um, and we saw, I was pointing out that after those uh, ratings for increased well-being, but we saw a very similar pattern for persisting positive mood. Um, so we're seeing some convergence there which gives us a little confidence. So I've talked a lot about this type of thing happening, and that's very, you know, soaring with the angels, with your uh, Krabby Patty in hand, angel wings. That's what, that's what we've been shooting for so far. But once in a while, this guy shows up, and that's a part of the package too, and you have to deal with that, and we're trying to carefully analyze this. So, um, you know, the dark side, if you will, the challenges, the difficult experiences, you could call these bad trips. We encourage people to take the whole thing as a meaningful package and try not to um, uh, paint it in that, with those terms, bad trip. But that's what most people are calling this. Um, so in this data set, 39% of folks, that's seven out of 18, had extreme ratings of fear, fear of insanity, or feeling of being trapped. Interestingly, out of those seven cases, so, in, and that, I should say, that was, that could have been at any moment, you know, just a minute, at, at least some point during your you know, seven to eight hour session. Maybe for some people it could have been a much longer duration. But at least some point you had one of these intense um, negative reactions. Um, out of those seven people, six of them uh, had this type of reaction in response to the 30 milligram dose. And only one of the seven had it to the 20 and nobody had it to any of the lower doses. So, now, um, this is really interesting because on um, measures of, it's admittedly arbitrary, but we have a priori criteria for what defines a, a complete mystical experience, and that's a, a metric we can look at in conjunction with this. Going from 20 to uh, 30 milligrams, you're only increasing the odds of having a so-called complete mystical experience by about five, 10%. But you're increasing the chances 
of a very difficult or terrifying experience several fold. So this is very, we think, very important to understand. And given the variability, I mean, think of that. You're not in, for drugs, that's on a, a very big increase, going from 20 to 30 milligrams. Um, the fact that the adverse effects, um, the rate, the chances of them happening increase many fold, you know, several hundred percent. And the increased benefit is only a few percent. Um, it really makes you, uh, you know, it, it provides some interesting data about what is the appropriate dose in what setting. Now, we, we are still using that 30 milligram dose, and I think people go further out. Um, the nature of the experiences seem a little more bizarre. Um, it may be the case for some people that 20 wouldn't have been enough to hit it. But uh, so if you really want to like maximize your chances that something interesting is going to happen, you know, 30 a, a, is a good bet. But you better be prepared to um, deal with a higher rate of um, negative effects. And if you have, you know, some work like if someone starts looking at, um, you know, PTSD or some type of severe anxiety, these type of data could be very important in deciding. Well, maybe we don't want to go all the way to the uh, to the uh, 30 milligram dose. So here are some, uh, go back a little bit, there you go. Some other data generated from that study, which are currently um, uh, under review right now. We found it was a great opportunity to examine one of the adverse effects we picked up um, and didn't really study very carefully on our first study, but we found systematic dose-related increases in headache occurring after psilocybin. Um, there's not a, there's some uh, data about this, but not a lot. This is sort of the um, best sort of within subject controlled trial to really examine this. Um, so we see the propensity of having a headache is increased such that at 30 milligrams, about 80% of the people, almost everyone's having a headache. Um, in terms of the duration, we also saw a dose-related increase from 5 milligrams, about 7-hour headache, to about a 15-hour headache with a 30 milligram dose. And also, the severity seems to be dose-related. Um, we use a three-point scale, mild, moderate, and severe. No, none of the headaches were rated as severe. But um, out of the mild and moderate, the proportion of moderate headaches increased. These, this is the black amount of these bars increased and was the highest at the highest dose. So when we published, uh, uh, we're publishing these data with a colleague, Andrew Sewell, who's done some work with um, cluster headache. And so um, although these data are showing increases in headache, it's a, um, very interesting, some of the work being done showing that uh, uh, cluster headaches could be sensitive um, in a therapeutic sense to psilocybin in terms of preventing or aborting cluster attacks. These could provide, um, we speculate on this in the paper, but these could be, data could be providing some clues into what may be going on there in terms of that therapeutic effect. Here's some data we recently published. Uh, all, th these come from a retrospective analysis of uh, both our first and our second studies. We, we had data from everyone uh, pre-post on personality, um, uh, using a validate personality question, the, the NEO personality inventory. Um, it covers what are considered five major um, uh, domains, um, validated uh, domains of personality, dimensions of personality, if you will, neuroticism, openness, extroversion, agreeableness, and conscientiousness. Um, openness is dis defined specifically as the aesthetic appreciation, since is aesthetic appreciation and sensitivity, imagination and fantasy, broad-minded tolerance of others' point, uh, viewpoints and values. Um, not uncommon to hear people say things like that about the changes that have come about from a psychedelic experience. And so, lo and behold, we found that as a group, everybody, um, counting everybody, um, there was a significant increase in, in, in the personality dimension of openness, and we did not see it. It wasn't even close for any of the others' um, personality dimensions. Uh, I think even more powerful than that, we have some internal validity here and again, pointing to this interesting mediating effect of the nature of the experience. Um, those who had a complete mystical experience um, by our a priori um, criteria showed a significant increase in openness. And those who did not didn't even show a trend. Not only wasn't it significant, but the averages weren't even increasing. Um, they were, in fact, decreasing a little bit, but that's not uh, significant. So. You know, like the persisting follow-up data, here again, we're seeing 
an important mediating role of the nature of the experience, specifically the mystical or spiritual nature of the experience. Um, and as far as we know, this is rather unprecedented. We, of course, need to see it um, uh, evaluated in different labs and in different ways. But um, some things have been shown to change personality. They typically occur over decades, or there are things you can't do in the lab, like getting married, getting divorced. Um, some, non, some research, but not controlled, randomized trials have shown, for example, that antidepressants um, over the course of long-term treatment can uh, show changes in some um, personality dimensions. But we believe this is the first evidence ever showing that a relatively discrete laboratory event in a randomized trial can change a validated and psych a psychometrically reliable personality dimension. And the other important thing about that is that we think this increase in openness is completely consistent with some of the therapeutic um, applications that we believe are very feasible, including an anti-addiction treatment and including um, helping folks with a cancer diagnosis overcome um, anxiety and uh, depression um, about that and about their potential death. And some recent data on folks using mushrooms out there, wherever they may be. We had 60, over 1,600 participants complete a, a web survey about a profound experience after ingesting psilocybin mushrooms. 35% of participants met criteria for a complete mystical experience on the Panky Richards Mystical Experience Questionnaire, which we've used in a lot of our research. In our studies, that rate at a high dose of psilocybin ranges from about 60 to 70%. So um, it's interesting that you get a number, a number as high as 35%, but keep in mind this is a self-selected sample. Obviously people who might have more positive feelings about psilocybin might be more likely to complete a survey like this. And also you have a completely uncontrolled set and setting out there. Some of these people may have been doing essentially what we're doing in the lab. Some may have been out in the woods. Some may have been at a party. Um, who knows? Uh, but certainly the fact that we're seeing a, you know, a third of these folks having the same type of um, profound mystical experience that we're seeing in the lab is suggesting that what we're doing in the lab isn't that unrelated to what folks are doing out there. And uh, in fact, if you ask enough people why they um, uh, use psychedelics, you're going to hear some things about, about a mystical experience or something that could be described as such. Um, we also use it as an opportunity to, to uh, provide some psychometric data on the Panky Richards scale, which has been used in our studies and some others, um, but uh, has never been formally psychometrically validated, so to speak. So we found through factor analysis four factors, and this is roughly consistent with the work that's been done with Hood's mysticism scale, which has been rigorously validated. We have four domains. One, um, and this is basically how these different domains move and groove together. So uh, unity, noetic quality, and sacredness seems to form a unit. That seems, these, those questions tapping into those things seem to move and groove together. They, they act as a unit. Um, the next dimension being positive mood. Another dimension is transcendence of time and space, and another dimension would be the ineffabil ineffability or paradoxicality dimension. So again, consistent with uh, other questionnaires. Participants endorsing having a mystical experience. In other words, when we said straight out, do you consider your experience mystical? Those who said yes had significantly higher factor scores on each of the four factors. Again, another form of internal validation. Um, factor scores were also correlated with ratings of enduring personal meaning and spiritual significance, which is also significant. The four-factor structure we replicated in a second sample of over 400 people, and it was reliable. Um, so overall, this study extends our previous laboratory work finds with psilocybin occasion mystical experience, and we think um, helps to relate them to um, experiences folks are having in non-laboratory situations. I'll speak very briefly about this, one of our therapeutic applications. Um, the, uh, this is not a controlled trial in the sense we don't have a randomized a pl a placebo or a randomized control group. Um, but we have actually four people now, I'm showing you three. We essentially combined our standard approach, which I've described, um, a highly prepared uh, uh, and supported way to administer psilocybin, with what I call bread and butter cognitive behavioral techniques um, for supporting sm smoking cessation. Um, so you can see here the target quit date. Um, these are two graphs showing urinary cotinine and breath carbon monoxide. These are two biological markers that tell you whether someone's been smoking or not. The first psilocybin session day, you can see, boom, it's to the floor. 
um, up to 12 months for two subjects, six months for one subject. We're going to get her in the lab. She says she hasn't smoked since, but we'll confirm that in about a week or two. Same thing with uh, uh, carbon monoxide. We have a fourth subject. I haven't updated my graph, but he's been, shows the same exact trend up until 10 weeks. So we're very encouraged. Just received a grant from Hefter Research Institute to expand this to another 12 to 15 participants with the goal of supporting an NIH grant that would support a truly randomized controlled clinical trial to look at this once we uh, have all of our methods worked out and can show that this is at least plausible. Um, I'll just mention very briefly, we have a cancer study, people dealing with anxiety and depression related to a cancer diagnosis. This is the website, cancerinsight.org, please go there. This is open to folks that are um, national, out, they don't have to be in Baltimore, others says they have to be in Baltimore. This study, you can be from anywhere in the world. Um, we even have some travel funds that are available for those that need, may, may need it. Um, uh, may not have enough money to make the travel. Also mentioned that our colleagues at NYU, a little closer to uh, some of you folks, also have a very similar, not identical, but a very similar cancer trial. So I'd encourage you to seek out one of these two um, studies if, if you or a loved one um, might benefit. Um, and I'll go over, I'll go very fast, I'll go over um, switching pharmacological classes, a first study with a salvia, uh, salvinorne, the active ingredient salvia divinorum, most of you probably know what that is, ancient uh, sacramental use among the Mazatecs, potent kappa opioid agonist, it's usually smoked, um, a lot of people have used it at this point. Um, it's important for understanding not only the use of this drug, but also um, animals on salvinorne don't administer cocaine anymore and they do the same thing on other cap agonists. This is really exciting um, as a potential drug abuse medication. This is the traditional view of salvia div norm, an absolutely beautiful plant. These photos are from Kathleen Harrison, um, who's lived and uh, studied with the Mazatex. Um, these are flowering tops over here on the left. And not a lot unlike the other, um, its cousins in the, in, the, in the same genus that you might find at Home Depot. Those aren't gonna have the uh, uh, Salvinorne, the psychoactive property, um, uh, some indigenous healers. But this is the modern view, which folks are becoming familiar with. Um, you know, a little foil packets of this stuff with claims about, you know, five million times X or whatever they're calling it these days, which the data suggests don't have like, any reliability to them, so don't be fooled. Um, and this has become our recent face. And Miley Cyrus, had, she was kind enough to um, take her bong hit about one week after we published our study, which got a lot of media out to our lab. Baltimore Sun had done a tiny little piece that literally they said is going to run on like page nine or something. They'd come out, they were like one of the only folks that bit at a, a press release we, uh, we released through Hopkins. And lo and behold, when this happened, the next day, get the call, we're running you on the front page of <laughs> the Sun. So thanks, Miley. I should have added to her to my acknowledgments. So I'm going to go very briefly. This is some initial, we have more subjects. I'm going to show you data on four participants. We have eight now. We're working on writing up an analysis, analysis looking at uh, more measures. Um, but these were hallucinogen users, unlike some of our other studies. Um, about 30 years old, two males, two females, well-educated, had used uh, uh, salvia at least a few times and other psychedelics. They had 21 sessions with 16 active doses of salvinorum, which increased, also had some placebos. On the last session, we repeated the highest tolerated dose and collected blood, um, which was an interesting endeavor. Um, this is how we came up with uh, our FDA approved a salvinorin vaporizer, which you might recognize. Some of our subjects called a crack pipe made out of chemistry parts. To some aficionados here, you might uh, correct that to say it's more like a methamphetamine pipe, uh, uh, substance placed in the glass and the glass heated from underneath, or an old hash oil pipe from the 70s, perhaps. This is where, on the right, where we, um, administered the drug. We had a room divider here. The person that lit the pipe, who was me for these four people, was on that side um, so that they could inhale through this tube. So they couldn't see me, so this was double blind, because I could obviously see what was in the pipe. Um, the, per the staff member on the other side, who more interacted with them more directly during the experience, sat over here in this invisible chair off the screen, and uh, was able to interact with them um, uh, during the session while maintaining the blind. 
uh, they inhaled for 40 seconds, blah, 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 not important, I already said it. Beautiful data we got. We were wondering how well is this like, sort of, you know, smoking out of a glass pipe gonna work? Some pharmacologists will say, you can never do that, you have no control over dose. Well, I'm showing you only every other dose here, so it's not just completely crazy since we did so many doses. Well, we got extremely orderly dose-related effects, larger doses causing more of an effect. I'm showing you overall drug strength on the left here. Ooh, I haven't noticed that my axes are a little unintelligible here. Sorry for that. Zero means no drug effect. One or two or two different levels of possible effect. Maybe I feel something, maybe not, not sure. Uh, three to 10 are definite effects with 10 meaning as strong as I can possibly imagine for this drug. Um, the effects were down to past, they peaked at the first uh, time point at two minutes, and then, uh, and these are subject rated effects, this is the participant saying how strong the effect is, and it came down to below the definite effect level at about tw 20 minutes on average. This is the hood mysticism scale. Interestingly, we see dose-related increases on that, including significant um, uh, scores at the highest three doses. Th this means, filled in means they're significantly higher than the placebo condition shown over here. And just for comparison, and again, I apologize, I'm just noticing about some graph problems, but whatever. The, uh, the score from our first psilocybin studies right here, it's in the same ballpark, although I wouldn't draw too much comparison. It's, it's um, too crazy to go across studies to put too much stock into that comparison. But we're getting in the ballpark of these types of far out mystical effects. Um, nothing on physio um, uh, physiological measures. These are peak changes in pulse. Um, really didn't see any. Um, we saw a little blip on blood pressure at the beginning, but remember, this was, an, for safety reason, increasing doses. So this is totally confounded by dose. This is actually people on their very first session, nothing to do with salvinorin. They're just really nervous about this crazy drug we say we're about to give them on their first session. So that has nothing to do with the drug. Um, we also look for tremor. Some of the primate data shows tremor at very high doses. Didn't see anything like that. Um, just wanted to, to, to read one, one or two of the um, narratives here to give you a flavor beyond the data, the, the, the graphs. After finish this one? Okay, I think I got a, a good one here. After inhalation, I immediately felt like I was being sucked down into a black hole at the time. Um, and at, this, at the same time, I became disturbingly aware that I was being watched by the researchers. It was as though they were on the edge of the hole looking in, and they were a little cartoonish with big black glasses and pointy eyebrows. At the bottom of the hole was a very young being that was ready to take me. I literally felt as though one of my arms was holding onto the edge of the hole and the other arm was being pulled by the young being and I was stretching and stretching. After a bit, it was um, as though this young being's parent established contact with me through dialogue. Um, this being told me, um, that uh, when we come into their dimension, it is as though we are popping in and that there is no control as to where this happens or who we meet. I thought to ask if there was a, a name for them, the being said they are the wonderkin. And, and this participant in subsequent sessions, and this was a common thing we had, repeated interactions with same types of experiences for that person, which really struck us. Um, in fact, before this happened, we actually suggested to her, well, if you run into these characters again, ask them who they are. And she didn't, they, they said, I guess. <laughs> um, and I'll, some other far out narratives, but I'm moving along here um, to a conclusion. Salvinorin can be safely administered. Uh, and under careful laboratory conditions, systematic effects, um, including those, uh, you know, uh, appears to have hallucinogenic effects, no surprise, and mystical type effects with remarkable intensity. We'd of course like to do that controlled study for smoking cessation. We're gonna be finishing our, can hopefully, uh, we're gonna have, we're about halfway through our cancer trial, but we're really gaining some momentum. Um, so looking forward to that being completed. And also we're doing some work now on the effects of psilocybin in conjunction with meditation practice um, and other spiritual practices. So we're working on that now and starting some more work in that domain. Um, and this, that work falling in the category that Jim Fadiman spoke of this morning, you know, this is not just about how can we treat disorders. Our biggest question, those are a little bit derivative for us. Um, this, these are just some fascinating questions uh, about the human animal and the nature of, of humans, and um, I consider myself a basic scientist at heart, and I consider the heart of what we're doing basic science that has implications regardless of whether there are medical applications. Um, 
but we like to do a bunch of it, salvinurin would be a great drug to do a bunch of cool things with, including brain imaging uh, and other questions. But I want to return to my acknowledgement slide uh, to give them also the last word, and I want to thank everybody for listening and thank Neil once again. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. It's just wonderful work you guys are doing, and the portfolio of research you're doing is, Thank you. is just mind-blowing. Questions? No one has a question. I just have a quick comment. Matt, and that was a really great presentation. Oh, thank, thank you. Thank you. A lot of material really quickly. Um, yeah, I'm uh, affiliated with the NYU Psilocybin Cancer Group, and I just, like, on behalf of the psychedelic community, I want to thank you guys for what you're doing. You're welcome, and thank you. <laughs> question was the saying the psilocybin was causing the headaches, yet with the cluster headaches it was being used to treat, and just kind of like, kind of your com more like comment on that. Yeah, so these were not cluster headaches that we, and in fact, um, we didn't, even though I said we, this is our, our collection of data on headache was more systematic than the first study. In fact, I wish we had been more systematic. We don't really have the nature of the data we would even really need to, to determine if these were migraines versus tension headaches, for example. We certainly don't think these were our cluster headaches, but nonetheless, we think they point to mechanisms that can be in common and that it could potentially speak to that therapeutic application. Um, um, beyond just cancer patients who are having um, depression or you know, fear of death, are there any plans maybe to do studies on people who are just having sort of economic problems in their life and depression in life and seeing if just economic. using these drugs just make you feel better and enjoy life and, you know, help with, I don't know, part of the preamble of American society, mm -hmm. the desire to be happy? So I think that's a great question. The, uh, yeah, we don't have an indirect answer. We don't have immediate plans to do that. Um, I think in part that's sort of a strategic um, question. But absolutely, I think what we're looking at is robust antidepressant effects. You plug that into someone who's struggling with, you know, um, a problem they've been dealing with, like like quitting smoking or some other uh, other addiction. Um, a, you throw that into someone who's struggling with deep existential questions about death, who might be dying soon, and any of these, a strong antidepressant effect. I mean, I think we're when I say antidepressant effect, it doesn't sound very exciting because. The antidepressants, while they're great to have and can help, they're not, they certainly aren't miracle cures. Um, and sometimes they don't do a whole lot. But um, we're talking about what we, have, at least in our hands, what looks like very strong antidepressant effects. Um, um, so absolutely, I think in terms of people who are generally dealing with both um, in the, anxiety, the anxiety spectrum and the depression spectrum, I think there's potential for for those applications. I think we're looking at a very general mechanism. That's the thing. It's like with the cancer trial. It could be any terminal illness. And then, it kind of, then bringing, going to what you're saying, it doesn't even have to be about, I mean, we're all going to die, actually. <laughs> so even from that lens, so absolutely, more generally, that would be great Other to questions? look at, and we hope to. Somebody who hasn't asked yet? Hi. Um, I'm interested in um, clarification. You touched on it. on. Um, what's been called bad trips or, or bad experiences, and you, you said difficult responses. Uh -huh. um, because a lot of those, I think, while very difficult while in them, and maybe called bad while in them, can later be um, seen as to be beneficial. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. Yeah, so absolutely. And I, try, I thank you for bringing that up again, because I think I needed to highlight that a little more. The majority of people, not all of them, but the large majority of people who are describing very difficult experiences is like, I went to hell, like, <laughs> yeah, and are very convincing. Um, now, whether they end up incorporating that into a narrative in which that is part, a key part of what they went through that um, helped, like they had to go through that to face their demons, so to speak. So absolutely, in most cases, and, and, I, and who knows what the nature of that is, we, of course, encourage the entire, them to make meaning out of the entire process. So is that just our suggestion, or is it an automatic product of the psilocybin? I don't know. We know that psilocybin looks different than other drugs under double-blind conditions, but um, 
I think it's, yeah, that's a very important point, and I think that's the way, um, the best way to move forward is encouraging people to kind of treat the whole thing as a view into themselves and what are other, what other, using whatever framework they hold, you know, their worldview, um, and to take the whole thing and make meaning out of it. Question here. Um, yeah, in one of the studies you showed, you compared psilocybin to methylphenidine. Why were those two drugs used as a comparison? Yeah, it's a great question. Um, so as uh, Lee Barra touched on earlier, the active placebo is great because if someone simply feels something, ooh, I'm tingling all over, and if you know it's only going to be that psilocybin or placebo, like, duh, I'm on you know, psilocybin because I'm feeling this thing in my blood system um, and your body feels different. So an active placebo is a way to fool someone. Now, you might say um, an experienced psychedelic user um, would know the difference between a, a stimulant like Ritalin versus psilocybin. But take someone who's never taken a psychedelic substance, like in that first study, and give it to them. And it's, and we have the data to support this, you can, credibly, you can really fool people. Um, we know our blinding conditions work, even with our very experienced monitor. Um, uh, so, it has, so in terms of why that is, it has a very similar time course, about six hours. Um, so if someone read on the internet that psilocybin lasts about five to six hours, it could fool them on that dimension. And in certain, certain other dimensions, there's some type of positive, although you might say superficial, in certain respects similarities, like a positive uplift in mood, um, certainly thinking differently. So yeah, we thought it was similar both in time course and that it was similar if they could fool someone who hasn't had a psychedelic. Question over here. So with the... With the slide that um, ha you were showing the difficult experiences, yeah. the 30 milligrams, I was wondering if that, I'm not sure if this is the same study, but I was wondering if that, um, if you looked at how many of those were incurring in the either the, the deep end condition or the sort of going in slowly and then incrementally increasing the dose. You mean across dose or within the session? Like, well, whether those... So they, they were much more likely at the higher doses, yeah. If yeah, that was a question. Yes, that was the case, but um, I'm wondering whether those were in the conditions whether they received the high end first or. Oh. Or, yeah. yeah, I got you. That was fair. We. We didn't have, we didn't see any difference there. There might have been a little trend there, but it wasn't near enough to say that we even think there's anything. So. Um, has your research ever um, included uh, indigenous people who use it for religious reasons? Yeah, there's, um, there's been, there hasn't been any, I would say, laboratory randomized research with, um, but there's been some very good science, observational um, and controlled. Uh, Dr. Halpern, who's here, did a, a study with Native uh, Americans who participate in peyote ceremonies and did a very careful analysis of neurocognitive functioning and showed that they weren't harmed by years of use. So there, and there's several other, there's an older literature from the 70s, several studies showing the same thing. Um, and, and, and John Halpern's also uh, documented in it, this in uh, um, uh, Santa Daime group too. So yeah, there's been some some reach, research into and it's 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 you know that research is really consistent with the lab research. I mean, we see really low rates of alcoholism in Native Americans um, who are in um, who who partake in peyote in the Native American church. Now, that's on a controlled randomized trial, so you can't make, can't make an absolute causal statement, but it's very suggestive. Um, you, know, you need to look at it with other methods, too, because we know church or religious involvement generally is, is correlated with decreases in alcohol and other drug um, abuse. Um, but yeah, there has been some good work um, in examining the indigenous cultural uses of these substances. Matt, thank you very much. Thank you.